in February this year, an online Australian reporter and her news website employer, Yahoo 7, published an article about a murder trial which contained material that had not been put to the jury. The trial had to be abandoned and a new trial ordered. The reporter and her employer were convicted of contempt of court. Yahoo was fined Australian $300,000 and the reporter was put on a two-year good behaviour bond. That is one example of why we have contempt laws, to assist the justice system to operate fairly, effectively and expeditiously in the public interest. Contempt laws give courts powers to ensure trials are not prejudiced by unfair publicity, as occurred in the Australian case. Court hearings are not disrupted. Jurors decide cases only on lawfully admitted evidence and do not do their own research. Judgments and court orders are able to be enforced. And the judiciary is protected, as far as practicable, from false and serious attacks which undermine confidence in its independence, integrity and impartiality. The right to freedom of expression protects vigorous, even extreme criticism of court decisions, but it does not confer an absolute right to make false statements about the judiciary, especially when constitutionally the judiciary is not permitted to respond. The courts have powers to imprison or fine people who are found to be in contempt. It is obviously necessary in the public interest for courts to retain these various powers. The question is, why has the Law Commission recommended changes? There are three main reasons. First, the law needs to be accessible. At present, the law of contempt is a curious mix of common law, court decisions, developed in a piecemeal fashion over many years, and a range of statutory provisions. Common law contempt offences are the only offences not in a statute. Second, the law needs to be easily understandable. At present, the language of contempt law is antiquated and the boundaries, especially between contempt and freedom of expression, are uncertain. Third, the law needs to be workable. In particular, it needs to be updated to deal with the challenges of the digital age, especially the internet and social media. The Commission's key recommendation is a new statute. The Administration of Justice Reform of Contempt of Court Act, which, uh, if enacted, would put into statutory form most of the current contempt laws. A draft bill with a commentary is included in our report. The opportunity is taken in the new bill to modernise the language of contempt, to replace outdated common law offences with new, more appropriate provisions, to give courts powers to sentence for breaches of the new provisions, and to assist the media to clarify where the line between freedom of expression and the new provisions should be drawn. I'm going to summarise next the specific recommendations and the reasons for them in five different areas, starting with publication contempt. The purpose of publication contempt is to ensure that people charged with serious uh, criminal offences receive fair trials. If a person's right to a fair trial is not protected, the trial may have to be adjourned or abandoned and any conviction may need to be overturned on appeal and a retrial ordered. 
An abandoned trial will be emotionally stressful for everyone involved, complainants and witnesses, as well as the defendant. There will also be significant financial consequences for the state-funded court system. We therefore propose clearer statutory rules governing the publication of information about an arrested person's previous convictions and any concurrent charges. New statutory powers allowing the courts to make temporary suppression orders, postponing publication of information that poses a real risk of prejudice to an arrested person's right to a fair trial and a new statutory offence to replace the common law contempt of publishing information where there is a real risk that the publication would prejudice a fair trial. The second area relates to disruptive behaviour in the courtroom. The purpose of contempt in the face of the court, as it's currently known as, is to ensure court hearings are not disrupted and dis delayed. Hearings which are disrupted or delayed impose significant costs on the justice system. A recent example is a case involving a man whose brother was on trial in the district court and he, the, 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 that the first person, behaved in a threatening and intimidating way towards the jury while it was delivering its verdicts. Jurors were shocked and upset. One was in tears. The man who disrupted the hearing was convicted of contempt and sentenced to six weeks imprisonment. On appeal, however, the sentence was reduced to four weeks imprisonment. In that area, we therefore propose a new standardised procedure for dealing with disruptive behaviour in the courts that interrupts proceedings and interferes with the court's ability to determine proceedings effectively and efficiently. And we also propose a procedure which should be fairer for persons involved and should reduce the number of appeals. The third area is juror contempt. The purpose of juror contempt is to ensure that persons facing a trial by jury receive a fair trial. An essential requirement for a fair trial is that the jury decides the case only on the basis of lawfully admitted evidence which is able to be tested during the trial. Information on the internet or social media is not lawfully admitted evidence. Once again, if a person's right to a fair trial is not protected, the trial may have to be abandoned or a conviction set aside and a new trial ordered with all the emotional stress for those involved as well as the adverse financial consequences I've already mentioned. A recent example of such a case is one which reached the New Zealand Court of Appeal involving a sexual offending trial uh, during which papers were found in the jury room, including material discussing the definition of rape in the United States, which is expressed in quite different language to the provisions in our Crimes Act. On appeal, the defendant's conviction was quashed and a retrial was ordered. We therefore propose a new statutory offence to replace the common law contempt where a juror independently investigates or researches information which she or he knows is relevant to the trial and we propose compliance with court orders. The purpose of contempt laws in this context is to ensure courts have appropriate powers, including the ultimate sanction of imprisonment for the enforcement of their judgments and orders, other than money orders. In a recent example in the High Court in Auckland, two company directors who failed to comply with court orders requiring them to deliver information to the company's liquidators were held to be in contempt of court 
and fined $8,000 and $5,000 respectively. In this area, we propose a new statutory regime covering non-compliance with court orders in civil proceedings. I note in passing that provisions for the enforcement of orders in criminal proceedings are already in statutory form. And we propose clarifying that other courts, such as the family court, are within the new regime too. The fifth and final area I mention is abusive or false allegations against the judiciary. The purpose of contempt law in this context, what is still known today as scandalizing the court, is to ensure public confidence in the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the ju judiciary is upheld. At the same time, we recognize that criticism of court decisions, including strong criticism, is a legitimate exercise of the right to freedom of expression. And we also recognize that sometimes criticisms of judges are so, are so preposterous, no sensible person would take them seriously. We therefore propose the abolition of the antiquated contempt of scandalizing the court and its replacement with a narrowly defined statutory offense of publishing untrue allegations or accusations against the judiciary when there is a real risk that the publication could undermine public confidence in the judiciary. And we propose giving responsibility for the prosecution of the new offence solely to the Solicitor General, who will be able to decide whether it is in the public interest to bring a prosecution at all. Where allegations against a judge are preposterous, and where no action has been taken officially to remove the judge from office, the Solicitor General might well decide there is no point in prosecuting the person who made the allegations. In summary, the Commission believes the proposed new Act will mean contempt laws are readily accessible, understandable and workable, and we have, will have a modern statute with provisions that are clear and practicable. Thank you.